Well, I hope your day has been as good as mine. I got to start it early this morning with some brothers, and we uh, had a wonderful time together. And then this evening, being with some other saints, you have uh, done a wonderful job of taking care of me while I'm here. And I'm grateful for that. Thankful for your presence tonight and our opportunity to continue this study. I'm going to tell you, tonight I'm going to challenge you. Um, I've, if I haven't yet, tonight I will, and particularly in this area. I think I'm probably going to say some things that you're going to kind of squint your eyes and say, really, does it say that? And I welcome that because I'm going to take you into the text and we're going to look at things the Bible says. And I want you to do exactly what Brother Henry said in the prayer. I want you to test these things and prove them. And if they're true, I want you to apply them in your life, even as I try to apply them in my own life. So let's get to our lesson this evening. We're going to talk tonight about sharing spiritual gifts. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God saw man and he said, it's not good for man to be alone. That's not only true of the physical family that's under discussion in that chapter in Genesis, but that's true of the spiritual family. I want you to think through with me before we get deep into our subject tonight. God calls us into the body because we need each other. Not because it's just comfortable or it just is expedient, but because we really need each other. Why does the church exist? Solomon gives a really good answer in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. He says this beginning in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls... The one will lift up his companion, <clears throat> but woe to him who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Listen, there's no other explanation for the existence of the church that satisfies me than that. Because I'll tell you, and I know you, you may argue with me about this, but hear me out first and then let me explain it. I can worship alone. I know that it is made better by worshiping with others. Certainly easier for me to sing songs with enthusiasm when I'm singing with a group like you and being led like the brothers who've led us in this meeting this week. But I can worship alone and I can be pretty effective in my personal worship. And you not only are, but you should be able to at times worship God alone. And I can study alone. I mean, I believe the Bible was intended to be understood. And while it might be that the things we're talking about tonight are assimilated more quickly if somebody's sharing it with us, we ought to be able to understand God's will for us by ourselves if we work at it and we stay at it long enough. I can be righteous alone. I mean, I can be a righteous person. I can live a moral life without God's people. But I need the body because I need encouragement. I need help. I need wisdom. And the body supplies that. Just like the individual members of my body are only as good as their contribution to the welfare of the whole, 
My fingers work really well when they're at the end of the palms and the end of the arms and connected to the torso and supplied with blood from the heart. They work really well there, but take my 10 digits and cut them off and lay them out here. And how good are they? They need the body. I need the body of Christ. I need the body. Not just I like it, I want it, I enjoy it, but I need the body of Christ. So we've got this statement in uh, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. But encourage one another. <clears throat> day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Encourage one another. You know, you, you can't tickle yourself. You can't do it. I mean, I can take my fingers and I can gouge myself in the side all day long and I don't laugh a single time but somebody else walks up behind me and they goose me in the side like that and I burst out laughing don't test that I'm not the Pils <laughs> Pillsbury Doughboy you know but others can tickle us and make us laugh we can't do that ourselves you can't do that alone I need the body for encouragement. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, and we, we've looked at this passage once, but I think it's important again to see it for what it says. Hebrews 10 verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but what, but what, but sitting there quietly, right? No, it's not what it says, but making sure we're present. No, that's not what it says either. But encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, encouraging one another. That's done not by merely attending, but by consciously encouraging one another. I am a member of the body of Christ by rebirth, but experientially, Subjectively, I must be an active member of the body, meeting the needs of the other members of the body. So I want to talk to you tonight about sharing the spiritual gifts that are found in the body of Christ so that we can do what we just talked about, encourage one another. And I want to begin with some background. In order to share spiritual things with others, I first must have communion with God. I can't share God with others if God is not present in my life in a powerful way. I can't. You know, there are some things you can talk to me about and I, I'm in it. I, I know the material. I'm excited about that particular subject. We want to talk great classic movies. I'll talk with you about that. You want to talk modern art? Go find somebody else. It's not my subject. I just don't know it. I'm not saying it's not worth knowing and I'm not saying there's not value in it. That's not my point. I just don't know it. I don't know modern art. I can't share with others in the body of Christ if I don't have a strong communion with God. Where am I going to fill my water bottle? Because all I can share is what's in my bottle. And if, if I don't have God powerfully manifested and understood and embraced in my life, I don't have the ability to share living waters, waters with others. I can't do that. There's a, there's a great passage. It's really a kind of a cryptic passage for a lot of us, but I love the way it is worded. It's in John chapter seven, it's verse 38. 
It says, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his, listen, listen to this, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You hear the superlatives in that? It comes where? Not from the surface, but from our innermost being. And what will it do? Trickle? Squirt? Drip? No, it will pour. What? Pour what? Rivers, not streams, not rivulets. Rivers of what? Dead material. Dead literature. No, living waters. Living waters. But in order for that to be true for me, I have to have this kind of communion with God that we began this series with Sunday morning in our very first lesson. Because if I don't listen to God in his word, how will I hear his voice when he speaks through his children? You get that? I, I can only hear God when I'm familiar with his voice. When I know his voice, and I'm not talking about an audible voice. I'm talking here about the tenor and tone of the will of God. If I understand that, I will recognize that when I hear it from others. So the encouragement I receive is dependent on my communion with God. My ability to understand the truth of the scriptures comes from my communion with him. And then I have to have a mutual commitment and responsibility toward my brethren. I must be faithful to be with others, to be for others, to be there for others. We, we sang that song tonight. Tim just led us in that song. God, Help me live for others. I need to have that mutual responsibility and commitment. Hey, I'm yours and you're mine. And we're in this body together and we owe each other. When my back itches, my hands go into action to scratch it. When I need to go somewhere to eat, my feet take me there. My eyes help me see what is there. They're all working together and they all have that commitment to one another in the body. I also have to have respect for confidentiality. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but I'm going to tell you, the more we get into the lives of each other, the more critical it becomes that we demonstrate confidentiality. That when somebody shares something with us and they share it in confidence, that we don't violate that. That we earn the trust of brethren and we maintain that confidentiality as much as it is necessary. Look, I'm not saying that there aren't some things that people say, keep this to yourself. And you say, I can't. I understand that. Child abuse shouldn't be kept to yourself. That shouldn't be kept to yourself. Spousal abuse shouldn't be kept to yourself. Somebody may confess that. You probably need to go get better help for that than you and I can offer. But when people entrust the deeper things of their lives into our hands, our hearts, and our ears, we better demonstrate a responsibility to take that in. And... A, a third step of that is I need to make sure I'm feeling responsible for other people's concerns and don't feel bugged about that. Don't feel irritated by that. Now, I, I understand there is a time and a place for some things. And, and it's not always here. Every preacher, every shepherd, many deacons, and many women have experienced this kind of thing. You're in the foyer, you're trying to talk to people and there's somebody comes up and they want to get involved in a 30 to 45 minute discussion. While there are other people who need to be ministered to, probably not the best place to do that. Set up a better time when you can talk. 
But on the other hand, make time for that talk. Make sure that you're making yourself available to others. It shouldn't be that when somebody calls that we pick up the phone and roll our eyes and go, it's, it's Bill again. He's probably got another problem, something going on in his life. I'll have to take this call. That's not the kind of mutual commitment and responsibility that will lead us to develop and exercise our spiritual gifts with each other. And then let me give you one more caveat about this. No one of us can be equally responsible and intimate with everybody. I'm sorry, but we can't. And, and you may feel slighted because you try to talk to some person about a difficulty you're having in your life and they say, I'm sorry, but I, I can't deal with that. I can't handle that. We need to understand that even Jesus didn't deal with everybody's problems at the same level. He had 70 and he had 12 and he had three and they were all dealt with on different levels, different understandings, different responsibilities. So find each other in the body of Christ, people that can minister to you and that you can minister to because we do have this mutual commitment and responsibility. Now, let's move to another idea. Let me give you some essentials of sharing spiritual life with other people. First, and we've talked about it, is the truth. What we most have in common is truth. This is the alpha and the omega of our koinonia. It's the center of it. It doesn't come first from the fact that we all use the same language, that we all come from the same place, that we're all the same demographic, age-wise, socioeconomic wise hobby-wise. It's not that at all. Truth is the question, what's God been teaching you lately? Challenging to you, as we've already talked about in one of the earlier lessons. Should it be? If truth is the essence of what we are and we all are students in the school of Christ, shouldn't we be learning something about Christ every day that we're able to share with others so that this becomes what we are and what we connect to each other by. And it's not just sharing truths in a sterile bottle. It is sharing truth that is acted out and lived out in lives. Uh, let me tell you how this scripture applies in my life. Let me tell you what I've done with this truth from the Lord. Not just a cold commentary, but a living example of how truth acts, reacts, and enacts in our particular lives. And I need to listen to the truth from others. You know, God speaks through them. God speaks through new Christians. God speaks through children. I use this example all the time, but I love it. It's a, it's a story about a group of school children that went to a police department and they were doing one of those field trips and they're going through the police department and the people that are taking them on say, here are our jail cells and this is where we fingerprint people and here's the front desk and here's where we keep all of our equipment and all that. And then they came to this wall and it had a bunch of pictures on it. And the person that was taking them said, when, and when somebody asked a question, what, what are all these pictures? Who are these people? And he said, well, these are people that we're trying to catch. And one little kid said, why didn't you just keep them when you took their picture? <laughs> yeah. Just keep them when you take their picture. Sometimes great truths are spoken through simple, faith-filled, pure lips and hearts. 
In Luke chapter 10 and verse 21, Jesus said this, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise. Do you hear that? You've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. If truth is the thing I seek and I become familiar with truth, I'll recognize it when spoken in the mouths of babes. It will be what draws us together. Second, I have to have an openness. I need to be open. I need to be able to share sin and temptation and weakness and failure and fears that I have and discouragement that I experience in my life. It's what we call transparency. You know, when you go to the doctor, it's, it's, if your experience is anything like mine, it's something like this. You have an appointment at 8.30 in the morning and you show up in the waiting room at 8.30 on time. And oh, about 10, 1030, you get called back. And they take you down the hall and into a room. And the attendant tells you you're going to be in this room, if you will, strip down to your underwear and uh, sit on that table and the doctor will be in soon. You take off your outer garments in a room that's now feeling about 40 degrees and sit down on a table that for some reason is absolutely freezing and you wait again for the doctor to appear. The reason the doctor hasn't come in yet is because the doctor has to retrieve a stethoscope from a freezer <laughs> to come in and see how your heart beats and how your lungs can take in huge amounts of air when you go <gasps> because that stethoscope has hit your chest. Why do you have to strip down like that? Why take off most of your garments? Because the doctor needs to see your body. She or he needs to see your body because they may recognize something you yourselves would not notice or think was dangerous or concerning. We, we need to be transparent with one another. Now, I'm not saying every time we walk through the doors and somebody says, how are you doing tonight? That we begin immediately a litany of all the things that are wrong in our lives. Kind of goes back to the earlier point that I was making for you. But if the only answer we ever give to each other is fine, or I'm good, or great, or super, if that's the only answer we're giving to each other, we're probably lying. Because I have yet to meet the person that says every day is perfect and good, and I'm good every day. And there comes a time when I need to be transparent with others, when I need to say, I'm suffering, I'm struggling, I need some prayers. How can we pray that we be healed? How can we pray for others, as James says in chapter 5, verse 16, to pray for one another that you may be healed? How can we pray for healing if we don't know what needs to be healed? How can we do that? It's important for us to be transparent and to recognize this. Sometimes by being transparent about things we're suffering or dealing with or challenged by, we may find ourselves relating to other people who need that same information. Not just, it's not just I need to talk to somebody because I'm suffering, but if I talk to somebody about my sufferings, somebody else may say, you know what, I have that exact same problem and I need to deal with that. Isn't that exactly what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, when he said, For we are comforted with the comfort which we receive, and with that we're able to comfort others also. 
So oftentimes in, in dealing with the circumstances of our lives, we find ourselves ministering to others who also need that same information or experience in their lives. We also need accountability, a willingness to be checked out by others. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says we're to be, submit to one another. If, if I'm not going to listen to God as he speaks through others, then we might as well go it alone, folks. Take your chances. I'm not willing to do that. I need Christians and I need to be accountable to them. And I need to hear what my brothers and sisters have to say. So what is our goal? It's Romans chapter 15, verse 14. And all this that we've been leading up to right now, it's this conclusion. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. This is the tools. These are the tools that we're looking for to minister to others in the body of Christ. So, Let's look at some of those tools. Five principles for sharing spiritual gifts. Let me begin with, with this as we move into this section, the largest portion of our study tonight. I was driving through Chattanooga, Tennessee on the interstate and on the side of the road, I saw a sign outside a church building and it said this, exercise the spiritual gift that is within you exercise the spiritual gift that is within you. Now, I dare say some of you are saying Pentecostal. That's a Pentecostal group, charismatic group. Or you might say as an evangelical group. No, no. That sign was outside of the North Terrace Church of Christ where I've preached before. I believe that there are spiritual gifts that God's people today need to exercise. Now, I want to say this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, we learn how the disciples of the first century church ministered to one another and met each other's needs. And most of us recognize that is a demonstration of God's powers that is no longer available to the church or to people today. But we err if we limit spiritual gifts, all spiritual gifts, to the first century. There are spiritual gifts that are given to God's people today that are non-miraculous, but nonetheless come from God and are given to us to minister to one another. Let me show you what I mean. If you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. <clears throat> as each one has received, listen, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then he goes on to say, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Those gifts mentioned there and others we're going to look at, we're not through, are non-miraculous gifts, but they're gifts nonetheless. They come from God. Not everybody's a good servant. Not everybody's a good servant. Not everybody can speak well for God. There are some people who have difficulty leading silent prayer. It's not always easy 
for everybody to do everything. But we all have gifts and every member of the body of Christ has a function in the body. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses four through eight. Powerful passage, folks. Romans 12, beginning in verse four. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, we who are many, are one body in Christ, and we're individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Now, he does mention some miraculous ones. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. But now listen, if service in his serving or he who teaches in his teaching or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You hear that? Most of those, all of those, and I could even argue that the prophecy statement here could be speaking for God. It could be simply addressing people with a message from God, non-miraculous. But all the others are non-miraculous gifts. Look, everybody's not merciful. My dad was a wonderful man. He was a great Christian. He was a wonderful leader of God's people. But my dad had trouble expressing mercy. My mom didn't. Man, my mother, she was wonderful at being merciful and compassionate. I could come in with a splinter in my finger. And I'd come in, I'd go, oh, mom, I got a splinter I got a, look, in my finger. I got a splinter right there. And the first thing she'd do is suck air through her teeth. She'd go. And she'd squint her face up. Oh, she'd say, oh, I know that hurts. And then I thought, wow, it really does. <laughs> I mean, it's hurting more. You think it's just serious? Oh, we're going to have to get that out. I'm going to have to go get a needle or a knife and we're going to have to cut that out. We'll do, oh, I know it's going to hurt. Oh. And she'd be hurting as much as I was. It was wonderful to have my mother minister to me in that way. My dad was not that person. I could come in from outside. I could be carrying my left arm in my right arm. <laughs> And come in saying, Dad, I think I've done something really terrible. He goes, yes, son, you're bleeding all over the carpet. Go outside. <laughs> Some people have gifts of mercy. Some people have gifts of giving. Some people are just wonderful givers. You just barely touch them and they're pouring out their giving to other people. But not everybody's that way. I don't mean you're either a giver or stingy, but some people just have that gift of giving. Some people have that gift of leading. Not everybody's a leader. Everybody shouldn't be. These are gifts. Every member has a function. Every part of me serves my body. Every part of me. Every part has a function. Do you hear that? Listen, every one of you has a function in this body. And our abilities, our gifts help us carry out our function, the skills that we have. My fingers have different skills, talents, and abilities than my toes. They're different. My fingers have this ability to curl so that they can grasp. My toes can't do that very well. Not very well. Oh, yeah, if something's on the floor. I may be able to grab it with a toe and pick it up, but nothing like holding on like my, my fingers and hands can do. I'd never use my feet in a tug of war because they can't hold on. So we all have talents, every one of us. 
We all have skills and some are by experience and some are natural for us. And all of those help us fulfill our function in the body. And I serve the body, not vice versa. Look, if, if you've come here thinking, what's the body going to do for me? You're missing the whole point. You've exactly reversed the way we should be thinking and talking. It's what can I do to serve the body? My heart doesn't do what my fingers do. My eyes don't do what my kidneys do. My knees don't do what my neck does. But they all serve the body. And when the body grows strong, I reap the benefits of that. So in this matter, koinonia, as we've been talking about it, is primarily a responsibility, not a social privilege. For koinonia to take place, I must serve the body. Principle number two. The purpose of all spiritual gifts is to serve others and glorify God and or glorify God. The purpose of all spiritual gifts. First Peter chapter four, we looked at verses 10 and 11. Our gifts are given by God. They're given by God. That means what? I'm a steward, not an owner. I don't own the gifts. I'm a steward of the gifts. God gave those or that to me, and I have that responsibility. So, seeking fame or recognition or reward for exercising our gifts is exactly the wrong approach to take. It is true there are some gifts that are more recognizable than others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about that very thing. We read that passage the other night. I want to read it one more time for you. Verse 18 says, God has placed the members, each of them in the body, just as he has desired. Not everybody's an eye, not everybody's an ear, not everybody's a heart, but everybody has a function and all of us serve the body and each other. And in so doing, we glorify God. All of us need to glorify God. All gifts are for the body. All of us are servants of God. Recognition is not the goal of using our gifts. Serving others is. Principle number three, every gift is important and every Christian has a gift. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Do you hear that? I didn't say that. God said that. To each one, to everyone, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Every part of my body has a function. Every part of Ralph's body has a function. I've never been to a doctor and he says, you know what we're going to do today, Ralph? We're going to go through some pruning. You've got a lot of body parts you don't need. You've got more ears than you need. We're going to cut one of them off. You don't need both those eyes. We're just going to take one. You won't need glasses anymore. You can wear a monocle. Got more teeth than you need. You just need one up top, one up bottom. Make sure they meet. That's all we need. We're getting rid of that stuff. It's a lot of excess stuff you don't need. I've never had a doctor tell me that. I got excess body parts because every part of my body is important. And to say you have no fitting gift, if you're sitting here tonight thinking, I hear what you're saying, but I don't, I don't have a gift. I have nothing to give to this body. Is to say you have no function in the body. Now, I'm not being flippant when I say this. So what are you doing here? 
every one of us needs to have and recognize and use our gifts for the benefit, welfare of the body. Even the lesser parts are important to our well-being. And all gifts must be exercised and developed. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul said this to Timothy. For everything, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 14, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Don't neglect it. Timothy, do not neglect the gift that is within you. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6, he says, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, you may say, you might be saying, well, Ralph, I think those gifts that are talked about in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are miraculous gifts that were given to Timothy. I'm not going to argue with you that that's not the case. But isn't the principle, the same principle that's found in Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the talents? Do we apply that to ourselves? Sure we do. What is it saying then? God gives us things and he expects us to use those things he gives us to multiply the power of God in the world. Isn't that what it's about? So the man who had five made five more. The man who had two had two more. And the man who had one went and hid it. And what happened to him? He's cast into outer darkness. We better be using our gifts. We better exercise them and develop those to God's glory. Functions need to be at our best if we're going to really glorify God. That's important for us. Number five, last principle, and then I have one more major point and we're done. Stay with me just a few more minutes, please. There are greater gifts that need to motivate all of us. All of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 31 says, earnestly desire the greater gifts. And what are those? Well, they are faith, hope, and love. In chapter 13, verse 3, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and surrender my body to be burned but don't have love, it profits me nothing. <clears throat> Take a zero and add a zero to it. What do you have? Still got zero. Okay. Let's take 10 zeros. What do we have? Still have zero. Let's take a page full of zeros. What do we have? Still got zeros. Now let's take one and put it in front of the zeros and what happens to them. Pow! They're empowered. I think that's what Paul's talking about here. Look, you can, you can have a sacrificial heart willing to give up your very life for Jesus Christ. But if you don't have love, what are you? Zero, zilch, nada. You're nothing. Put love in front of that. Wow. It's powerful. Powerful things happen. Love empowers our gifts. And without love for others and for God, our gifts are just zeros, adding up to zero. I, I do so love the phrase in the, in the song that we sing. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. Love. Love is what brings the gifts together. It's what makes it happen. Now, I got one more question. How do you find your spiritual gifts? I hope you've been thinking, okay, Ralph, I'm with you. I hear you, but I don't know what my spiritual gift is. I have no idea. I really don't know. How do I find it? 
so that I can exercise it and develop it and use it for the family of God. And I'm going to give you three suggestions very quickly. Three suggestions. You apply these and I believe you will find your spiritual gifts. Number one, look to God. Ask him. Ask him. God, what, what is my gift or are my gifts? Some people have one. Some people have a lot of them. What are, what are my gifts? God, would you reveal that to me? And I believe he will. I'm not saying he'll say, you're a good servant. I don't think he'll do that. But I think he will make that known to you in some way or another. I believe God answers that because that glorifies him. It, it gives him the honor and the glory. God, what are my gifts? Help me use those for the body of Christ. Second, look at your successes and failures. What, what typically are you good at and not very good at? I'll give you a great example. When I lived in Concord, North Carolina, we had a group of men that would be in the foyer greeting people as they came in the doors. <clears throat> and this particular group of men would line up on both sides and people came down through the middle and the men would do something of this nature. <laughs> morning, morning. Occasionally a hand would go out and shake, but that was it. And, and I noticed it felt like you were running a gauntlet. <laughs> you know, like get outside the door and okay, get ready, go on through, we'll make it. Just keep your head down and don't let them stop you and you'll get to the auditorium where there's more friendly people there. And, and I had one of the sisters come to me and she said, Ralph, people don't like coming through the foyer. The men there just aren't friendly. They don't, they don't smile. They're, I know their hearts are good, but they're not conveying what they ought to convey. She said, we need people with friendly faces to do that. Now, I will tell you, when I talked to her about that, I was, I was just trying to put her off. I said, you know what, Nancy, if you think that ought to be done, you go back there and greet people. And she said, I will. <laughs> she started going to the back on the back side of the gauntlet, you know, between the gauntlet and the door. And people came in and she would greet them with this big smile and she'd introduce herself by name and she'd say, here's a here's a visitor's card. And would you fill this out for us? We're so glad you're here. Glad to have you here. People would come to me after services and say, I'll tell you what, that lady that greets people in the foyer, she's one of the best greeters I have ever seen. Is everybody a greeter? No. No, some people just aren't good at that. Is everybody a song leader? No, some people aren't good at that. Is everybody a teacher of classes? No, there are some classes I can teach. I couldn't teach the bucket class. You know what the bucket class is? That's the one that has those little permanent chairs that you put the kids in drop them in the buckets around the table and just leave them there. I can't teach that class. Those kids drool. <laughs> we don't all have the same gifts. And, and I've tried some of those things and I've realized I'm not good at that. Everybody's not good at everything. Look at your successes, but also look at your failures. Look at your failures. What are you not good at? Maybe that's not your gift. That's not to say you can't ever do it. But that's probably not the gift that is going to be used to help develop and encourage and minister to the people of God. Just take a look at them yourselves. What do you feel good about? And what do you feel uncomfortable about? And third, listen to others. Listen to others. Go ask. Be honest. Find somebody who will be honest with you. And say, what am I good at? What, what do you think I can do? Because all of us have a gift. Listen, I'm telling you, if you don't have a gift, you have no place in the body. Talk to people. Find out what you're good at. 
and then exercise those gifts as you listen to God, as he gives the answers through people and circumstances, as you take a hard look at your successes and failures and you listen to people who will be honest with you, who will be honest with you, you'll find out your gifts and you'll be able to minister to the people of God. We're going to sing this song of encouragement. And, and, and I, want, I will say this, if you're really struggling with finding your gifts, even after the things we've said tonight, it would be a wonderful thing if you came to the front and said, I want people to pray with me and for me to help me find my gifts. I want to serve this body. That'd be a wonderful testimony. And if that's where you are, in a moment, come to the front and ask for those prayers. Shepherds of this congregation will be glad to pray with you, and this church will. If you're not a child of God, the first thing you have to do is get in Christ and be in the body before you can exercise any gifts that you may have for the body. Put on Christ in the waters of baptism. Tonight, wash away your